Technology is drastically changing forensic investigations. We used to do investigations with just photographs and video. And what was missing was the three-dimensional perspective of that. So what technology is doing is when we're able to go out and take a, a laser scan and obtain a point cloud, this creates a, a three-dimensional uh, recreation of the scene. Now all of a sudden that, that two-dimensional object or perspective that we used to have is now three-dimensional. We now know XYZ coordinates to that. We can tell depth perception that we could not tell. The, the idea of perspective, and everybody thinks they understand it, um, but this notepad here is actually behind me, but it looks like it's right next to me, in front of me, on my desk. And it's, it's that perspective of the camera, and everybody thinks they absolutely know what happened. They know where the notepad is because they can see it on video. And in reality, if, you could, if we could look at this scene and come up at the top and look straight down, you'd see where that was. So things that used to be in the back are now observable because we can rotate the perspective to the side or to the top. And that changes everything. You'd be surprised at how much data is regularly collected on each of us. In fact, in 2020, a study was done looking at just security cameras and how many times we're each caught uh, just going out throughout our lives. Um, each week, 238 times we're captured just on security cameras alone. And we all know there's far more cameras out there uh, in the world today. Uh, your, your unfortunately common traffic accident, say at a large intersection. In that situation, you have video evidence available to us everywhere. You have the traffic cameras on that. You have highway cameras are everywhere. You have um, area businesses or homes perhaps have surveillance cameras, ring doorbells. Uh, you have bystanders often will pull out their cell phone and take video. Um, and so and then we also can dive into the vehicle's event data recorder, or sometimes it's commonly referred to as a black box, and that tells us all of the information, the inputs and outputs is going on with that vehicle. And um, you look at another scenario that we work a lot with are shooting incidents, and you have all of those same businesses, residences inside and outside, surveillance cameras, the officers involved are wearing body cameras, there's dash cams for their cruisers, there's mobile device video. So we have just this robust amount of data. Data points that can be used to scientifically reconstruct that, uh, that scene. The way I, the way I uh, kind of explain it to cops is, um, remember we used to, well, my generation used to put together uh, jigsaw puzzles, right? And you always had the blue sky up at the top and the buildings down below. And you always had that piece that was the tip of the church spire, right? And it was surrounded by blue, but it had a little piece of the building at the top. So you knew where that piece of, where that building was in the puzzle just because of that one little point. And then you knew if, if the, puzzle, if the point is here, the corner of the building has to be over here. And that's all this does, but does it in a three-dimensional way, is that if we have this data point here, then scientifically we can say the corner, the bumper of the car was over here, and if the bumper of the car was here, then this object must be over here. And you build this out in this three-dimensional puzzle, and then you can come back and look at it from every angle. Every single one of those videos is a robust package of data points that we can then merge into the point cloud and it gives us a digital twin that we can do scientific analysis of that scenario. We're really looking at it from a different perspective as an engineering firm to identify um, different crucial pieces of evidence, you know, exactly where a surveillance camera is located is really important to us when we get to the visualization process. You know, where is it on a building? How high is it on a building? You know, things that maybe aren't um, perceivable to law enforcement because they're not doing this type of analysis or, or they don't know the capabilities of all the information that they do have. Whether that be the 
pitch roll yaw of a vehicle. We may be looking at distance analysis over time, um, speeds, accelerations of a vehicle up to a crash, uh, post crash, anything along those lines. A shooting, if a shooting happens here, we may be looking at the, the distance between a shooter and a victim uh, at the time of a shot or leading up to or, or post shot here. It may be something where we're tracing along where evidence used to be that is not currently present anymore and, and seeing the differences between the then and the now of that scene. Um, if the camera was attached to a dash camera, that motion is actually going to be representative of a vehicle's motion here. So we can start to look at that in 3D space. One of the cases that we shared, we were provided a very short video um, that depicted the individual pointing the gun out of the door. And it, there was roughly 10 seconds of video where um, the individual was relatively motionless and just standing at the door, aiming the rifle out the, out the door. One of the hurdles in this case is it was a couple of years old. When I went to do my site inspection, um, the field where the, the individual who was shot had actually been excavated and changed extensively um, in preparation for um, some sort of construction on it. And so the police department had done a laser scan of that location. And so I was able to laser scan the inside of the residence, um, inside the residence, um, in the backyard of the residence, and then the road that uh, ran parallel to the field. And we were able to combine those laser scans and generate an overall point cloud that was able to forensically rebuild the scene. And we now had a 3D rendering of that short clip of him pointing the rifle out, out the door. And so once we had that 3D rendering, we were able to place a perspective over the top of it and place a line out into space, roughly to where the individual was shot. Through that analysis, we were able to determine that he was actually pointing the rifle um, approximately 50 feet you know, north of where the individual was located in the field. That was real conclusive that the video was not showing what people were initially thinking about it, and we were able to answer some questions in that, you know, steered the investigation to a different direction. Um, the idea of being able to uh, recreate a scene, um, you know, months and years later, and to place figures within that scene and, and to, uh, you know, look at it from every single possible axis and angle so that you could get a physical, accurate representation of the scene as it existed when the event happened was something that was new to us as a possibility and as a tool before it would just be relying on people's memories and uh, maybe a camera image here or there, but, you know, you're, you're still there's still so many blind spots in that type of recreation. Um, so this was really something that opened our eyes uh, as far as what, what's possible in providing defense to our clients. Another case that we shared was a dirt track race incident where a sprint car race was occurring. An individual had been crashed out into the, the, the fence. He decided to exit his vehicle. The next lap under a yellow caution flag, the last vehicle ended up veering and collided with him and ultimately uh, killed him. Uh, there was only one video from really far away in the grandstands of this dirt track that was able to catch this incident. Um, the camera was also moving throughout the filming of this incident back and forth. So that entire area was laser scanned to document the dirt track as a whole. That allowed the engineering team at that point then to analyze the movement of that vehicle and known physics associated with vehicle movements and everything to analyze the speed and the movement of those of those vehicles in 3D space. And so we were able to get overhead views and truly understand what was going on and what occurred in the incident. And more importantly, we were able to determine that the last sprint car actually moved up into the track, accelerated in the direction of the individual that stepped out of their sprint car, which was different than initially thought. So when we take the same bits of information that others had to evaluate and we place those things, and I'm speaking specifically about placing videos over point clouds, when you, when you correlate those things and, and tie that video down to the point cloud, which is an extremely accurate representation of the, of the scene uh, of the incident, when you tie that down to it, now you can analyze that from whatever perspective, figure out exactly what happened, and then figure out, by example, which direction the firearm was pointing. And it turns out 
that that firearm is not pointing where people thought it was. It's really giving tangible, hard evidence that's supported by engineering practices um, to the jury and to, to other clients and whoever the consumers are at the end to just thoroughly understand that case as a whole um, without as many questions. Now, we're, now we've got that foundation of science and now we can argue about, well, the van shouldn't have turned or the van should have turned and he couldn't see or she couldn't see. Um, but now we're, 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 now we're discussing it and debating it and deciding it at this level rather than 20 years ago when we were down at this level. Because you now have so much transparency um, and clarity of the video, and it's really showing it in its true perspective of three dimensions, you know, because that is how the incident occurred. You can find out exactly what happened, and you can, you know, uh, remove those variables that um, would lead to imperfect results. The investigators can can go down this road of of confirmation bias they can they can see one piece of information and and then they search for the the evidence to support that opinion and and it happens to all of us and and you have to be very very conscious of that that you're that you're not taking the the, the one piece of information and getting everything else to match it. You are holistically developing your hypotheses and then evaluating those to come up with the true, uh, um, you know, circumstances of the incident. And it provides so much more clarity because now we can look at this thing from different perspectives. Is there a witness that was there that didn't have a camera? Now we can place a camera and show what they could see or what they couldn't see. That is hugely beneficial because it helps validate information and also cross-check what, what we were provided as well from this rendering. And then we can also now place perspectives that maybe aren't additionally available, an overhead view or like a bird's eye view or something like that, just to give clarity to the, to the scene as a whole. So what it's really doing is it's, when you take science that far, you're taking out the, the opportunity for opinion. And, and you just push science so much farther in to where opinion doesn't come into play. Simultaneously, bias doesn't come into play. You alleviate that opportunity because you just push the facts of the case so much farther down the road uh, to where, to the point where now you start to interpret was that a, you know, was somebody at fault or did somebody do something wrong and who did that? You're, you're way further down the road than you were when well, frankly, without this this uh, this analysis process and and, and uh, um, you know 3D 3D reconstruction of these scenes and evaluations of them.